if these panelists don't have the solution <laughs> and entertainment and how AI is going to fix it, I don't know who does. Um, we have Jamana Arashi, the CEO of SMRG. We have Arie Borkov, the founder and CEO of, Lime, of Lion Tree, and Sam Engelbart, partner of Galaxy and founding general partner of Galaxy Interactive. And on the end, Songi Yoon, president and CSO of NC Soft. Media, investors, gaming, more or less, with some crossovers. Um, Jamana, let's start with you. Given your company has a huge portfolio of businesses, you cover TV, digital, print, social, I don't know what you don't cover, frankly, in this sector. And your job is to oversee the digital transformation. So how are you seeing the way to incorporate something like AI into your businesses? How is it going to change the way we consume your entertainment and your news? Well, uh, first, let me start by saying good morning, everyone, and good morning, Anna, and thank you for this question. I think, you know, if we're going to think about AI, let's first think about the economics of AI and what it can do and how it can impact our economy. A recent PwC report um, has highlighted that AI is meant to contribute almost $16 trillion to the global economy by 2030, $160 billion of that to Saudi Arabia. So there is a massive opportunity there from an economic perspective. However, as we, um, as media organizations, try to tackle what AI is, try to tackle generative AI, how it can improve the workflow, how it can improve efficiencies and increase creativity. Mm -hmm. I think that there is um, the term generative AI, especially with the liberalization of AI and the mainstreaming of AI through chat GPT and, and technologies such as BART, there has been two words that are synonymous with AI, which is excitement and fear. Excitement, um, because... And that sums up perfectly, yeah. <laughs> um, excitement because, of course, everyone is thrilled to be engaging directly with this technology. Unlike other buzzwords that we've heard over the past couple of years, this is here to stay, and this is integrated into our day-to-day -day interaction. Fear, because, of course, um, I think people think, is this going to replace us? Is it going to replace the human element of it? And this is the biggest issue that we face in the newsroom. Journalists tend to think that AI is here to replace them, to replace them and take away their jobs. But on, I think if you're going to look at it from a completely different way, it's, it will change your job. It will allow you to enhance your creativity. It will allow you to enhance your output. It will allow higher efficiency and potentially higher sources of revenue generation, given that you're cutting times, increasing creativity, allowing for these processes to be done in a much more efficient manner. A journalist no longer has to spend two, three days editing a report that he's done from any part of the world. That can be AI-led um, and can be done in a matter of hours. That means more content being created. And this is really what we're trying to um, institutionalize in the group um, through an AI strategy. But of course, um, you know, other fears exist, especially when it comes to a media organization with the responsibility of spreading news and information and creating news and information to inform and empower a population. The issues with AI that exist are, of course, misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes, hallucinations. Mm. You lose that element of validating and verifying that piece yeah. of information, but that's where that, that human element comes, and that's where regulation and proper strategy And issues comes that in. we definitely need to tackle sooner rather than later. Arie, you are, according to Hollywood Reporter, I loved where my research took me for this panel, um, media's hottest deal maker. So you're having conversations with the people right at the top. When you look and talk to them about how they evolve their companies and how they incorporate the technology, where does that take you? And are companies moving quickly enough? Well, I, I think, um, thank you for the question. I think that the hottest deal maker is His Royal Highness, uh, our host, uh, the Crown Prince, <laughs> well said. because of the beautiful way that uh, everyone's come together here this week. It's my seventh year actually being here, and uh, and uh, with Richard Atias and the whole group, and um, it's a very energizing place to be. And the blessing is that it will all be done uh, in the right way, with humility, and obviously the way to bring the world together properly, because you definitely feel like you're at the epicenter when you're here. Um, more than you do in Hollywood, frankly. Uh, and uh, that's just one part of the equation, which is the creativity. And Jamana and I have known each other for a long time also, and it's been great to work with SRMG and Jamana and play people here that really 
you know, see the world as it should be versus as it is today. And um, I think all that comes with a, me- a sense of humility and empathy and seeing the other person, which is really what AI is also about, because I define AI differently from artificial intelligence. I think about it from the perspective of alliance innovation. How do we bring existing industries into the new era together? Because with that, you bring societies, businesses, existing players into the new world with the most ancient and timeless metric, which is cash flow, not just getting um, so far ahead of everybody else all the time, but trying to bring it all together, which is kind of how we started at the beginning of COVID, bonded by health, and then we kind of lost our way in terms of this you know, kind of hyperdrive. And I think AI may be an opportunity to bring industries to the forefront. Content industries are probably um, the most complex to do that with because there's a lot of intellectual property and existing owned um, assets. There's information, misinformation, and the news channels like Jomana talked about. So it actually, I think AI managing businesses, managing industries, managing societies will make humans better because it takes a lot of um, power of the mind and the heart and the soul to actually govern the societies with AI and make sure it doesn't get away from us. A lot of the conversation we've had, particularly, I think, since the launch of ChatGPT last year, has been around AI, generative AI, LLMs. It's not the only technology in town. It's certainly not the only technology that is reshaping media and entertainment. And Sam, for you, because I know that you're interested in the space of virtual reality, what is the future here? I felt like there was a lot of hype, and pre-AI, all we could talk about was the metaverse. Now, do you think this technology is ever going to work in terms of our storytelling, for socializing, for working, for content creation? Hmm. Is there an application? Because at the moment, I bought a VR headset, I loved it, I got really excited, and then I, I think I stopped wearing it after about three weeks. <laughs> well, I, I think you're in good company in terms of people <laughs> that churn out of their headset relatively quickly. Um, I mean, first of all, I just also want to second everything Arya said. I feel so blessed to be here, and this has been an incredible week, and it's my, my third FII, so not as much of a veteran as Arya, but every time I come, I'm just astounded by the people I meet and the conversations that we have. And um, This conversation, and in some form, obviously AI is coming into every conversation that we have this week. It's such a big focus uh, in, in, of this programming, and rightfully so. Uh, this is the first, actually, first time VR came up for me this week which mm. tells you something too. Yeah. Um, I, I've been an investor in VR in one way or another now for 10 years. Um, I think I got lucky the first time around. I invested in an eye tracking technology company right when you know, we, we really thought VR was gonna be super hot in 2013. And you sold it 2013. to Google. And it was hot enough that Facebook bought Oculus and, and then our company got bought by Google and it looked yeah. like maybe it was gonna happen and then nothing happened. And, Google largely shut down their program. And so I, I've been through one of these cycles. There, there were probably you know, three or four similar cycles prior to that, going, going all the way back to military uses of VR in the early 90s even. Um, we're still some period of time away from first and foremost, a headset that's comfortable enough for people to really- It's gonna be use. hardware led. It's, it's, it's gotta be led by both. I mean, I think that's what Meta understands, and they, they, you, you can't really just put out the hardware if you don't also inspire people to, to, to create the software that you're going to use it, uh, use the hardware for. Um, I think Apple's doing something very smart in saying, let, even, even though the headset that everybody's talking about is far too expensive right now for enough people to buy it and use it for it to matter, but that's going to change over time, and they're, they're doing what Apple always does so well in terms of putting something out that at least lets you experience the full potential of what this is, even if you're not going to buy it right away or can't afford it. That, I think, is the key. And w- once the prices come down and it's comfortable enough, more people will, will get into, into this space. But what we, what we need to do for people to really understand the potential of this technology and why I do believe it's inevitable, um, there are just very, very few things in the world that can offer human beings a truly new conscious experience. And, and VR is one of those things when it's done really well. When, when you actually feel the presence, mm. and, and especially now that the screens are, are 2K or even 4K and, and, and above, and, um, and, and you're starting to really understand what it feels like to be transported <laughs> to a different place, that's where we're headed. And the form factor will, will you know, 
become comfortable enough in a relatively, I don't know whether that's five years or 10 years from now, but when you can have them on for a long enough period of time, and there's a lot of things that need to, to converge for that to happen, but w when that happens, I think we're all gonna realize that the great majority of the people in the world are actually going to have their most peak experiences in VR. And we can debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's the reality. And, and there's all these other things we're talking about in the world, climate change issues, you know, financial issues and other things that just mean that there are billions of people in the world that, um, th that aren't fortunate enough and may not be fortunate enough to have the analog physical mm -hmm. experiences that some of us get to have. And they're gonna have those experiences and they're gonna do things that they otherwise would not be able to do in a, in, in a digital environment. And it, it's just, um, we're all gonna need to travel less and we're all gonna, gonna need to use this technology. So this more. is gonna be something that we are gonna have to grapple with, I think, in, in the media, news, entertainment business, but possibly not just yet. But Songy, I mean, gaming's interesting because you've been immersed in both AI and VR for years while we drag the rest of the sector through it. What lessons can be learned for the rest of media entertainment from gaming and how it's transformed that industry? First of all, thank you so much for the question, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight, uh, this morning, and I really appreciate being here with the esteemed panelists. Um, first of all, gaming is a very interesting um, industry. It's a, we call it lens into the future, and it's always have been like at the forefront of innovation of technology, whether it's not just AI, but like a VR, AR, like cloud, uh, everything before the, the technology matures to be transferred in other industries. Gaming has been a very safe ground to test out the technology, and when it matures and safe enough, it goes to other industries. And it just, it's not just the technology, it's like a, um, uh, business models and other way of doing business on, on the kind of virtual platform. And the reason is because it's an entertainment, it's a safe, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is a client crash in a gaming, unlike driverless cars, it can have actual fatal, fatal uh, result. But at the same time, like uh, the gamers are early adopters in nature. So they, they, uh, they w want to experience, and that's kind of, they, they have a very high expectation for us to adopt this new technology. So gaming has always been this, uh, the kind of the innovation epic center where new technology has been tested. And I think it's not very, uh, it's, it's not different in, in the case of AI as well. I think we have been, I mean, for example, in, in games, all these boss monsters, NPC characters, are just kind of characters uh, that, that's kind of adaptive to, to user behavior that's not scripted. We have had our VP of AI designing the intelligence, uh, like kind of their decision-making mechanism since very uh, 2004, 2005. And uh, in like a moderating chat in a chat window, we use NLP technologies. Also for animation, we use a lot of the, the the AI assistant to help with animating creatures that's hard to animate with humans. Like a bipedal creatures are easier to animate, but like a characters with the four legs and the wings, it's really hard for humans to animate. So we use a lot of AI technology for that. Not only that, like churn prediction, the marketing, and also coming up with the pricing models, right uh, bundle of items that fits the play style of the party a uh, specific player is also like AI technology based. So we've been using it for all along and I think it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting to see all the hype and willingness. Finally, all the other industries are willing to adopt. And I think it's not very different from other GPT. Like, like it, there, is a, there is a terminology like GPT in economics before GPT-4, it stands for general purpose technology. So general purpose technology or technology like steam engine, electricity, broadband, that brought transformational changes to the industry and how we do the business. And if you look at the historical chart of the GPT adoption, there is, it always followed the kind of J-curve. It takes about 30 years for the technology to be adopted. And like a, first the 30 years, it's actually productivity goes down because people are trying to figure out how to use it for their businesses. For example, 
when the transformation from steam engine to electricity took place, the people uh, designed their factories it's as if it's a steam engine-based factory. It took generations of designers to come up with the conveyor belt model in about 10, 30 years to fully utilize its productivity gain. I think AI is kind of going through the similar curve. But probably a lot quicker. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but I mean, it has been around since 60s and 80s, yeah. right? We have gone through many, many cycles of AI winter, and it's like it's, it's about to come out of the J curve that it's actually be used for actual productivity gain. So like, in other words, if I have to start a gaming company from scratch today, it's going to be totally different. It will have a different org chart, different uh, technology, uh, fun, uh, basis of technology and how we do the business and how you distribute the content. So I think it's a really okay. exciting time. In the interest of time, we are going to have a quick fire round. <laughs> By the way, there's, there's, a theory, there's a theory called Amara's Theorem, which says exactly what you said, which is people tend to overestimate technology benefits in the short term and then underestimate them in the long term. So, which risks are worrying you the most if we are applying AI to this sector? Is it intellectual property? Is it creativity? Uh, being ruined by profitability? Where do you all sit? You each have, I'd say, about 30 seconds. Jamana. I would say misinformation for at least media. Misinformation in the sense that how this news is going to be consumed or news and entertainment, how it's created and how it's consumed. If it's no longer regulated and if it's no longer part of an institutional process where it's actually being delivered by subject matter experts and you're giving it or making it a bit readily available to people from various walks of life who don't necessarily have the ability nor the power to validate it, then the power to spread that knowledge and that information could have a severe impact on societies. I mean, ultimately, I'll be very quick, but I think, you know, the way that we're looking at generative AI is the same way that we've looked at social media with the rise of social media. Social media has very much liberalized and democratized influence and impact. But also created echo chambers. Absolutely. Are you? I would say um, the human essence and education. What I mean by that is when people talk about AI, they go right to the head, but don't deal in issues of the heart, which is a very special place for humans to live and bond together in empathy and other feelings. And that could be something that along with the proper education, which I think tackles Germana's point on misinformation, um, is the most important risk factor and way to go in to counterbalance this AI progress. Oh, I love that. Focus mm. on the human. Sam. Okay. Short-term risk, I agree with Jumana. It's misinformation. That's a problem. It's here now. We're going to deal with it. We all know we will in, for example, the Longer upcoming time? election cycle. This, the technology doesn't need to get any better for this to be a major problem for us, and we need to figure it out. Medium-term risk is unemployment. I think we're, we're gonna have major shock in all of these industries and we're gonna have to figure out what to do before, before we've realized all the inevitable um, gains from, from AI really that hit us individually. We're gonna have to deal with all the people that don't have jobs as a result of the technology and that's a very, very real legitimate concern. Long-term risk, the, the biggest one is artificial general intelligence. Now, mm. what percentage chance that is of happening is a different conversation, but if we really look at what could offset all the long-term incredible gains from AI that are coming is the doomsday scenario with AGI. Songyi, you have the, uh, the last. You only have 15 seconds, but I might give you an extra. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a, uh, there are many things, but the one thing I'm really focusing on is that uh, really for the next generation of AI engineers, they have that kind of sense of responsibility because a lot of uh, like what the content and the technology they produce will have enormous impact on society. Thank you to all of our panelists, fantastic insights. I like the quick fire round. Maybe we should bring this back for all the panels. Thank you very much. <laughs>